October 3rd, 1899, Volume 2, Louisa Deals with Lady Obedience. Priests must be apart from any earthly or family interest. This morning, Jesus continued to make himself seen afflicted. I did not have the courage to say even one word to my most patient Jesus, for fear that he might resume his plaintive speech about the state of the religious. This because obedience wants me to write everything, and also that which regards charity towards one's neighbor. And this is so painful for me that I had to fight by the force of my arms with Lady Obedience, more so since she changed her appearance into that of a most powerful warrior, armed with his weapons to give me death. In truth, I found myself in such constraints that I myself did not know what to do. To write about charity towards one's neighbor, according to the light that Jesus made me see, seemed impossible to me. I felt my heart being wounded by a thousand prickings. I felt my mouth being struck dumb and my courage failing me. And I said to her, Dear obedience, you know how much I love you, and that for love of you I would gladly give my life. But I see that I cannot do this, and you yourself can see the torture of my soul. Oh, please do not make yourself an enemy. Don't be so ruthless with me. Be more indulgent with one who loves you so much. Oh, please, you, yourself, come to me, and let us discuss together about what is most appropriate for us to say. So it seemed that she laid down her fury, and she herself dictated what was most necessary, enclosing in a few words the whole sense of the different things that regarded charity. At times, however, she wanted to be more detailed, and I would say to her, It is enough that they understand the meaning with a little bit of reflection. Isn't it better to enclose all the meaning in one word instead of many words? At times, obedience would surrender. Others, I would. And so it seems that we got along. How much patience it takes with this blessed lady obedience, truly a lady, for it is enough to give her the right to Lord, that changing her appearance into that of a most meek lamb, she herself makes the sacrifice of toiling and allows the soul to rest with her Lord, placing herself around her with a vigilant eye so that no one may dare to molest her and to interrupt her sleep. And while the soul sleeps, what does this noble lady do? She drips sweat from her forehead, hastening the toil that belonged to the soul, something that truly causes every human mind, the most intelligent, to be stupefied, and shakes every heart to love her. Now, while I am saying this, in my interior I keep saying, But what is this obedience? What is it made of? What is the nourishment that sustains it? And Jesus makes his harmonious voice heard to my hearing, which says, Do you want to know what obedience is? Obedience is the quintessence of love. Obedience is the finest the purest, the most perfect love, extracted from the most painful sacrifice, to destroy oneself in order to live again of God. Being most noble and divine, obedience tolerates nothing human in the soul, and nothing which does not belong to it. Therefore all its attention is on destroying within the soul everything which does not belong to its divine nobility, 
that is love of self. And once it has done this, it cares very little about whether it alone struggles and toils on behalf of the soul, while allowing the soul to rest peacefully. Finally, I myself am obedience. Who can say how amazed and ecstatic I remained on hearing these words of blessed Jesus? O oh, holy obedience, how incomprehensible you are! I prostrate myself at your feet and I adore you. I pray you to be my guide, teacher, and light along the disastrous path of life, so that guided, instructed, and escorted by your most pure light, with certainty, I may take possession of the eternal harbor. I stop here, almost forcing myself to go out of this virtue of obedience. Otherwise, I would never stop speaking. So much is the light of this virtue which I see, that I could endlessly continue writing about it. But other things call me. Therefore, I keep silent, and I go back to where I left. So I saw my sweet Jesus, afflicted, and remembering that obedience had told me to pray for a certain person, with all my heart I commended him to him, and Jesus told me, My daughter, may he make all of his works shine with virtue alone, but especially I recommend that he not meddle in the things of family interests. If he has something, let him give it away. If he does not, I do not want him to get involved with anything else. He should let things be done by those who are supposed to, while he should remain disentangled, free, without getting muddy with earthly things. Otherwise he would encounter the misfortune of the others, who since they wanted to meddle in some things of their families, from the beginning, all the weight then fell upon their shoulders. And I only because of my mercy, had to permit that they would not prosper, but rather become poorer, so as to let them touch with their own hands how unseemly it is for a minister of mine to sully himself with earthly things. On the other hand, and this is word that came from my mouth, the ministers of my sanctuary, as long as they do not touch earthly things at all, would never lack their daily bread. Now with these ones, if I had allowed them only to prosper, they would have sullied their hearts and would have cared neither about God nor about the things pertaining to their ministry. Now, bothered and tired of their state, they would want to shake it off, but they cannot, and this is the penalty for what they should not do. Afterwards I commended a sick person to him, and Jesus showed his wounds, which that sick person had given to him. I tried to pray him, to placate him, to repair him, and it seemed that those wounds would heal. And Jesus, all benignity, told me, My daughter, today you have performed for me the office of a most skillful doctor. For you have tried not only to medicate and to bandage the wounds which that sick person gave to me, but also to heal them. So I feel very much soothed and placated. Then I understood that by praying for the sick, one comes to perform the office of doctor for our Lord, who suffers in his very images. October 3rd, 1901 Volume 4. Louisa offers herself in a special way. There is no greater obstacle to the union with God than the human will. Having received communion, I was thinking of how to offer something more special to Jesus, how to prove my love and give him more pleasure. So I said to him, My most beloved Jesus, I offer you my heart for your satisfaction and an eternal praise of you. And I offer you all of myself, even the tiniest particles of my body, 
like as many walls to be placed before you in order to block any offense which might be given to you, accepting them all upon myself if it were possible, and for your pleasure, until the day of judgment. And since I want my offering to be complete and to satisfy you for all, I intend for all the pains which I will bear by receiving upon myself the offenses given to you, to repay you with all the glory which the saints who are in heaven were supposed to give you when they were on earth, that which the souls in purgatory were supposed to give you, and that glory which all men, past, present, and future, owe you. I offer them to you for all in general, and for each one in particular. As I finished speaking, all moved by this offering, blessed Jesus told me, My beloved, you yourself cannot understand the great contentment you have given me by offering yourself in this way. You have soothed all my wounds, and have given me a satisfaction for all offenses, past, present, and future. And I will take it into account for all eternity like a most precious gem, which will glorify me eternally. And every time I will look at it, I will give you new and greater eternal glory. My daughter, there is no greater obstacle which prevents the union between creatures and myself, and which is opposed to my grace, than one's own will. You, by offering me your heart for my satisfaction, have emptied yourself of yourself, and because of your emptying yourself of yourself, I will pour all of myself into you, and from your heart a praise will come to me which will carry the same notes as the praise that my heart gives to my Father continuously, to satisfy for the glory that men do not give him. While he was saying this, I saw that by means of my offering, many rivulets were coming out of every part of me, which poured over blessed Jesus, who then with impetus and greater abundance poured them over the whole celestial court, over purgatory, and over all peoples. O oh goodness of my Jesus, in accepting such a meager offering and requiting it with so much grace, O prodigy of the holy and pious intentions! If in all our works, even trivial, we made use of them, what traffic would we not produce? How many eternal properties would we not acquire? How much glory would we not give to the Lord? October 3rd, 1903, Volume 5 Jesus continues his life in the world, not only in the Most Holy Sacrament, but also in the souls who are in his grace. I was thinking about the hour of the Passion in which Jesus took leave of his mother to go to his death, and they blessed each other, and I was offering this hour to repair for those who do not bless the Lord in everything, but rather they offend him in order to impetrate all the blessings which are necessary for us to preserve ourselves in the grace of God, and to fill the void of the glory of God, as if all creatures were blessing him. While doing this, I felt him move in my interior, saying, My daughter, in the act of blessing my mother, I also intended to bless each creature individually, and all in general, in such a way that everything is blessed by me. Thoughts, words, heartbeats, steps, and movements made for me. Everything, everything has been given value by my blessing. Even more, I tell you that everything good that creatures do was all done by my humanity, so that all the works of creatures might first be divinized by me. Furthermore, my life, real and true, still continues in the world, not only in the Most Holy Sacrament, but in the souls who are in my grace. 
and since the capacity of the creature is very limited, and one of them alone is unable to grab everything I did, I act in such a way as to continue my reparation in one soul, praise in another, thanksgiving in another. In some others, my zeal for the salvation of souls. In another, my sufferings. And so with all the rest. According to how they correspond to me, I carry out my life within them. Therefore think of what constraints and pains they put me into. While I want to operate in them, they do not pay attention to me. Having said this, he disappeared, and I found myself inside myself. October 3rd, 1906, Volume 7, Jesus Speaks About Simplicity. As I was in my usual state, Blessed Jesus came for just a little and told me, My daughter, simplicity fills the soul with grace to the point of diffusing outside. So if one wanted to constrain grace within her, this could not be done. In fact, just as the Spirit of God, because He is most simple, diffuses everywhere without effort or strain, but rather naturally, in the same way the soul who possesses the virtue of simplicity diffuses grace into others without even realizing it. Having said this, he disappeared. October 3rd, 1907, Volume 8 how one's own self renders God a slave. As I was in my usual state, blessed Jesus would not come, and I was tormented by the pain of his privation, and not only by this, but by the thought that my state of victim might no longer be will of God. I seemed to have become nauseating before God, worthy only of being abhorred. Then while I was thinking of this, he came for just a little and told me, My daughter, one who chooses his own self, even for one instant, represses grace, becomes the master of himself, and renders God a slave. Then he added, the will of God makes one take the divine possession, but obedience is the key to open the door and enter this possession. Having said this, he disappeared. October 3rd, 1908, Volume 8 As long as the soul is in the continuous attitude of operating good, grace is with her. This morning, blessed Jesus made himself seen, just a shadow, and told me, My daughter, as long as the soul is in the continuous attitude of operating good, grace is with her and gives life to all of her actions. If then she is indifferent to doing good, or she is in the act of doing evil, grace withdraws, because it is not something that belongs to it and unable to take part in it or to administer its own life, sorrowful it departs with great displeasure. Therefore, do you want grace to be always with you and my very life to form yours? Then remain in the continuous act of doing good. In this way you will have my whole being developed in you, and you will not have to grieve so much if sometimes you do not have my presence. In fact, you will not see me, but will touch me in all your acts, and this will soften in part the pain of my privation. October 3rd, 1918, Volume 12, How Justice Must Be Balanced. I was praying, blessed Jesus, that he would placate himself, and he came for just a little, and I said to him, My love, Jesus, 
How awful it is to live in these times. Everywhere one can hear tears and see pains. My heart is bleeding, and if your holy will did not sustain me, I certainly would not be able to live any longer. But oh, how much sweeter death would be to me. And my sweet Jesus told me, My daughter, my justice must be balanced. Everything in me is in balance. However, the scourge of death touches souls with the mark of grace, so much so that almost all of them ask for the last sacraments. Man has reached such a point that only when he sees his own skin being touched and feels he is being destroyed, he shakes himself. While the others, as long as they remain untouched, live light-heartedly and continue their life of sin. It is necessary that death harvest in order to take away many lives which do nothing other than make thorns sprout beneath their steps, and this in all classes, lay and religious. Ah, my daughter, these are times of patience. Do not become alarmed and pray that everything may abound to my glory and to the good of all. October 3rd, 1922, Volume 14 Necessity that the Virgin be aware of the interior pains of Jesus Continuing in my usual state, I felt oppressed, because blessed Jesus often allows that I suffer while the confessor is here present. And I lamented to him, telling him, My love, I beg you, I implore you, do not allow again that I suffer in the presence of any one. Let everything pass between me and you, and that you alone be aware of my pains. Oh, please make me content. Give me your word that you will not do it any more. Even more, make me suffer twice as much. I am happy as long as everything is hidden between me and you. And Jesus interrupting me told me, My daughter, do not lose heart. When my will wants it, you too must surrender. Besides, this is nothing other than a step of my life. My very hidden life, my interior pains and everything I did, always had at least one or two spectators. And this with reason, out of necessity, and in order to obtain the purpose of my pains themselves. The first spectator was my celestial father, from whom nothing could escape, since he himself was the one who inflicted those pains upon me, he was actor and spectator. If my father had seen and known nothing, how could I satisfy him, give him glory, and bend him to mercy for mankind at the sight of my pains? Their purpose would have failed. Secondly, my mamma was spectator of all my pains of my hidden life, and this was necessary. Having come from heaven to earth to suffer, not for myself, but for the good of others, I had to have at least one creature in whom I was to place that good which my pains contained, and therefore move my dear mamma to thank me, to praise me, to love me, and to bless me, letting her admire the excess of my goodness so much so that, captured, enraptured, and moved at the sight of my pains, she prayed me that in the face of the great good which my pains brought to her, I would not exempt her from being identified with my own pains in order to suffer them, to repay me, and to be my perfect imitator. If my mamma had seen nothing, I would not have had my first imitator not a thank you, no praise. My pains and the good they contained would have remained without effect, because since no one would have known them, 
I could not have made the first prop, and the purpose of the great good which the creature was to receive would have been lost. See how necessary it was that at least one creature be aware of my pains? If for me it was so, I want it to be so also for you. Even more, I tell you that I want the confessor acting together with me as spectator and depository of the pains I make you suffer, so that he too may share in their good. And having him with me, I may excite him more in the faith and infuse in him light and love to make him comprehend the truths I keep manifesting to you. On hearing this, I remained oppressed more than ever, and while I had hoped for mercy, I found justice and unshakability on the part of Jesus. Oh God, what pain! In seeing me more afflicted, he added, My daughter, is this the love you have for me? Times are so very sad, and the troubles which are coming are too horrifying. And when you are not able to prevent the whole course of my justice by yourself, you will be able to do it in two, and you yourself should ask me to make you suffer. Therefore, resign yourself also in this, and be patient. Your Jesus wants it, and that is enough. October 3rd, 1928, Volume 24 Exchange between Jerusalem and Rome In creating man, God placed as many seeds of happiness in him for as many things as he created. My poor mind was thinking about many things regarding the divine will, especially about how its kingdom could come, how it could spread, and many other things that it is not necessary to write on paper. And my beloved Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, My daughter, if Rome has the primacy of my church, she owes it to Jerusalem, because the beginning of redemption was precisely in Jerusalem. Within that homeland, from the little town of Nazareth, I chose my virgin mother. I myself was born in the little town of Bethlehem, and all of my apostles were from that homeland. And even though ungrateful, she did not want to recognize me and rejected the goods of my redemption, it cannot be denied that the origin, the beginning, the first people who received the good of it, were from this city. The first criers of the gospel, those who established Catholicism in Rome, were my apostles, all from Jerusalem, that is, from this homeland. Now there will be an exchange. If Jerusalem gave to Rome the life of religion and therefore of redemption, Rome will give to Jerusalem the kingdom of the divine will. And this is so true, that just as I chose a virgin from the little town of Nazareth for the redemption, so I have chosen another virgin in a little town of Italy belonging to Rome, to whom the mission of the kingdom of the divine fiat has been entrusted. And since it must be known in Rome, just as my coming upon earth was known in Jerusalem, Rome will have the great honor of requiting Jerusalem for the great gift received from her, which is redemption by making known to her the kingdom of my will. Then will Jerusalem repent of her ingratitude and will embrace the life of the religion that she gave to Rome. And grateful, she will receive from Rome the life and the great gift of the kingdom of my divine will. And not only Jerusalem, but all the other nations will receive from Rome the great gift of the kingdom of my fiat, the first criers of it, its gospel, all full of peace, 
of happiness and of restoration of the creation of man. And not only will my manifestations bring sanctity, joys, peace, and happiness, but the whole of creation, competing with them, will unleash from each created thing each of the happinesses it contains, and will pour them over the creatures. In fact, in creating man, we placed in his being all the seeds of the happinesses that each created thing possessed, disposing the interior of man like a field that contained all the seeds of happinesses, so much so that he has within himself all the tastes to be able to savor and receive into himself all the happinesses of created things. If man did not possess these seeds, he would lack the sense of taste, of smell, to be able to enjoy what God had put out of himself in the whole creation. Now by sinning, man caused all these seeds of happiness that God had infused in him, in creating him, to fall ill. And therefore he lost the taste to be able to enjoy all the happinesses contained in creation. It happened as to a poor ill one, who cannot enjoy all the flavors contained in foods. On the contrary, he feels heaviness. Food itself converts into pain. Everything gives him nausea. And if he takes it, it is not because he enjoys it, but in order not to die. On the other hand, one who is healthy feels taste, strength, warmth, because his stomach has the strength to assimilate the goods contained in foods, and he enjoys them. The same happened in man. By sinning, he caused the seeds and the very strength to be able to enjoy all the happinesses contained in creation to fall ill, and many times they convert into pain. Now with the return of man into my divine fiat, the seeds will acquire health, and he will acquire the strength to assimilate and to enjoy all the happinesses present in the order of creation. So a contest of happiness will begin for him. Everything will smile at him, and man will return to be happy, as God had created him. October 3rd, 1937, Volume 35, Prodigies of Creation Doses of power, sanctity, and so forth, that God put outside for love of man. The acts done in the fiat will always be new, each one more distinct and beautiful than the other. These acts will enclose everything and will form the speaking seas, works, and steps of their creator. I was doing my round in the creation in order to trace all the acts of the divine volition, to make them mine, hug them, adore them, and place my little I love you in recognition of how much the divine will loved me and did for me and for all. Oh, how many surprises! How many new things can be understood! How many divine secrets of their creator created things contain! My always adorable Jesus, visiting my little soul, seeing me all surprised, told me, My daughter, our works are always new, and they harmonize with their Creator. There is so much harmony between them and us that they always know how to say new things about the one who created them, even more so since they are inseparable from us and receive new contact with our divine being. This is why, in following the acts of my divine volition, you always find new surprises and understand new things of our works. You must know that when we delivered the creation from the womb of our divinity, since it was already within us from eternity, in letting it out of our fiat, we also put out, within a sea of love, 
all that the creature had to do. Therefore all came out of ourselves, and we were offering all that she was supposed to do. So the whole of creation is crammed with all the works that have to be done until the last man. Although invisible to human eyes, this is visible and palpitating for us in our will, forming a more beautiful creation than creation itself. And our love is so great that as this creation occupies the whole atmosphere, we bring it into our divine womb. So as we deliver the creatures to daylight, with our own creative hands, we begin offering to them all that they have to do, as principle of each of their acts. We place the life of our fiat as foundation, and our love as food for each act, since we do not do or give anything if it doesn't have our will for principle and our love for food and asset. It would be work unworthy of our supreme height, giving things that have nothing of our life and that do not possess the food of our love. The whole of creation was a birth, with all the acts that the human generations were supposed to do always kept since eternity in our divine womb, which unable to contain it any longer, for our love's need to deliver it, wanted to pour it out. So as we delivered the creation, we also delivered all that the creature was supposed to do, since when we do an act, we make it complete. Our divine fiat, enclosing all within itself, creation and human acts, placed itself in waiting to deliver the creature to daylight, to administer to her the acts that belong to her. Isn't this an exuberant love that only a god could have, to order and form the acts, and then to deliver to light the one who was to use those acts, to form the sanctity, the love, and the glory for herself and for the one who created her? But this is not all. Our love never stops. As this birth came, we put outside of ourselves a dose of our power in order to sustain the creature and her acts, arming and equipping them with divine power. Therefore she has our power that sustains her. We also provided a dose of our wisdom, which had to animate her intelligence and all her acts. So if new sciences, new inventions and discoveries, almost incredible, can be seen in the creature, it is because of our wisdom that invests her. In the same way, we put out a dose of our love, of our sanctity, of our goodness, and of all our attributes, to give her love, sanctity, goodness, and so forth. The creature did not yet exist, and we were already busy with him, in him. We longed for our power, wisdom, love, sanctity, and beauty, placing ourselves at his disposal to make him as beautiful as we could, and to say, You are like us in everything. We could not have made you more beautiful than this. The fact that we gave out our divine qualities and all the acts that man had to do, even before he came to the light of time, was for us a love so intense as to seem unbelievable. In our delirium of love, we went on, saying, O oh man, how much I love you. I love you in my power. I love you in my wisdom, in my love, and in my sanctity. I love you in my goodness, and even in the acts that you will do. I love you so much that I place them all in waiting for you. Our divine volition, to which we entrusted everything, our divine attributes, as well as the very acts that will be yours, is in the act of offering them all, as an outpouring of its love for you. 
But this was not enough for our love, which, if it could be what it cannot, would render us unhappy. You must know that our Supreme Being possesses by nature an act always new. Therefore, these acts, established for each creature, will be new and distinct from one another, distinct in their sanctity, ever new in their beauty, one more beautiful than the other, new in their love, new in the power, new in the goodness. These are acts formed and fed by us, so they possess all our characteristics, all beautiful, various in sanctity, love, and beauty, each one different from the other. They will be our order, the type of our various beauties, the fecundity of our love, the harmony of our wisdom. How it shows in the creation that all our works all of them are beautiful. Heaven is not sun, wind is not sea, flowers are not fruits, but all of them are beautiful, although different from one another. Even more, they form the harmony of the various beauties, the true image of our acts and of the creatures themselves. You must know that these acts in my divine will form an army of new beauties, of new love, and new sanctity, and we feel enraptured by merely looking at them. So we anxiously wait for the coming of the creatures who, by possessing our will, will be equipped with them and possess them. See how certain it is that the kingdom of my will will come upon earth. Its acts already exist. Then they will be unleashed from within my will as a noble army, and they will let themselves be possessed by the creatures. My daughter, the whole of creation, everyone and everything, came out of my fiat, and into my will they must return as a work worthy of our power. We will remain fully glorified only when we will recognize ourselves in the creature and in her acts. We can give all, and she can receive all, as long as our divine will reigns. But if it does not reign, she forms an abyss of distance between herself and us, and there is nothing we can give her. Yet this is not all, my daughter, since it is a firm decision to give the kingdom of our will to creatures, we want them to know the goods contained within it, and where their acts done in our divine will can reach. In fact, if they do not know its goods, we would have many blind, deaf, mute children, unable to speak of their creator. Not knowing these goods, they wouldn't even love or appreciate what they possess. But in our will, all have a clear sight, a fine hearing, and a word animated by creative strength. They will have the gift of gab, always something to say, to the extent that all will remain amazed. Even the heavens, charmed, will lower themselves to listen. The children of my will will be the joy of all and the true narrators of their creator. Only then will we find some who are capable of speaking about us, since it is not they who will be speaking, rather my will will be speaking within them. Only and exclusively my will is able to and knows how to speak of our supreme being. Therefore, keep listening. As soon as the creature will possess our volition, all her acts, small and great, human and spiritual, will be animated by my will, so as to rise between heaven and earth, investing and braiding together the sky, the sun, the stars, and the whole creation. Then, they will rise even higher and will invest all the acts of the Queen of Heaven, 
identifying themselves with them. These acts will have the power to invest the acts of our divinity, our joys, and beatitudes, as well as those of all the saints. And once they've enclosed everything within themselves, without leaving anything out, all victorious, they will present them before our Divine Majesty, offering them to us as complete acts which lack nothing. Oh, what a joy! What a glory for us, finding in these acts the sky, the sun, all the acts of the Queen of Heaven, the love with which she loved us, our own acts, our joys, and our unceasing love. These acts, done in our will, redouble for us the glory of creation, redouble the glory and the love that we received from the Sovereign Queen, redouble our glory and the glory of all the saints. It is sufficient to say that our will has entered into this, to say everything and include all. Wherever our will enters, it knows how to make a fury of love and glory, centralizing itself in everything. After all, everything is its own, so it has the right over all. The wonders that these acts, done in my will, form in the soul, are unspeakable. Through them, our divine fiat forms seas of love, not murmuring seas but speaking sees. They speak about our love with such eloquence that we like it very much, and we want always to keep listening. The voices of this creature wound us. Her words are like darts. She always has something to say about the story of our love, and we like it so much that we always remain attentive to listen to her. We do not want to miss anything that regards our love. How beautiful it is to hear the creature who possesses our sea of speaking love, always speaking about our love. And my will, possessing the creature who lives in it, is up to things of every stripe. It forms the works that speak of our works, the steps that speak of our ways. In sum, since our will is word, Wherever it reigns, it gives speech to all that the creature does, making a divine prodigy out of it. Therefore, there is nothing greater, holier, more beautiful, that glorifies us more than living in our will. And there is no good greater than this that we can give to the creature. So be attentive and follow me if you do not want to stop my saying. End of October 3rd Fiat